Well, thanks so much for joining us here at Cornerstone Church, Colchester. We're beginning a new series today in the Book of Acts as we prepare for uh, Passion for Life. Uh, it's a, a national initiative to seek to reach others with the Gospel of the Lord Jesus, and we're partnering with other churches across Colchester um, to that end. Um, we'll be meeting um, in person to pray with other churches on January the 24th, Monday, January the 24th from 7.30 to 9.30 and then again on Monday the 28th of February from 7.30 to 9.30. William Wade, who will be the speaker uh, for Passion for Life in Colchester, uh, will be visiting us and encouraging us in our lives of prayer and proclamation. Let me just read uh, Acts chapter 1 verses 1 to 5. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> well, let's just pray. I'm going to use some of the words that we've, we've sung. O breath of life, come swooping through us. Revive your church with life and power. O breath of life, come cleanse, renew us, and fit your church to meet this hour. O breath of love, come breathe within, renewing thought and will and heart. Come love of Christ, afresh to win. Revive your church in every part. Amen. Well, I don't know how you're feeling about uh, passion for life. For some of you, this might be complete news. What is a passion for life? Uh, it's an initiative we're now sort of focusing on between now and Easter. Uh, a number of churches have got together and we're seeking to reach out with the gospel together. So maybe it's a surprise to us. Uh, maybe we're aware that it's going to happen, but we're, we're just not feeling up for it, to be, to be honest. It's, uh, life is busy. Uh, it's so busy. Or, or we're feeling too sinful. How, how can I reach out to others with the gospel of Jesus when, when I'm feeling such a sinful person or maybe we're feeling too weak or, or me, maybe like me you're feeling all of the above. So it's great to come to the Bible uh, and see what God has to say about this great task of bringing the gospel to others uh, and I think this will help encourage us. But what the plan is for this term is I'm, I'm planning to speak for about 15 minutes uh, and then each week we'll be looking at a training video, uh, a video that will help equip us and help us to think about how we might go about sharing the gospel with others. So just two points this morning. First, Jesus is still at work because he is alive. And we know this, don't we? We know this in our minds, but I think <clears throat> the intent of Luke is to to teach this to Theophilus, the person probably who funded his writing of his two books, Luke, Luke's Gospel and Acts, which is really part of the same work. And he begins his second book like this. In the first book, O Theophilus, that was his Gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And the implication of that, that first sentence is that Jesus is still doing stuff. Jesus is still teaching stuff through his apostles. So Luke's quite convinced, even writing this, most likely after some of the apostles have died, that at this point that he writes, Jesus is still teaching. Jesus is still acting, even though he's no longer on the earth. See, he did things and he taught things, verse 2, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So Jesus is still active, even though he's now gone back to heaven. But he wants to, to remind Theophilus of 
how the apostles knew that Jesus was alive. In his gospel, he talks about the fact that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared on the Emmaus Road. He ate fish in their presence to show that he was physically alive. And then Luke records what Jesus taught. And we're just going to flip back to Luke's gospel. So keep a finger in Acts chapter 1. We're going to go back to Luke chapter 24 which is where he's recounted the road to Emmaus, the appearances of Jesus in the, the upper room, uh, Jesus eating fish to show that he was physically alive. And then we pick it up in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. See, Jesus is saying to his disciples in his resurrected body that he's just appeared in the middle of a room with locked doors he's just eaten some fish and he wants them to understand the plan of God what was the plan of God that the whole Old Testament was about Jesus would die Jesus would rise again and the gospel will be preached to all nations repentance will be preached to all nations this is God's plan I mean imagine the power that is needed for Jesus to have died for your sin and my sin and the sins of all he was going to save, to reconstitute his cold, dead body into a living spiritual body that showed, he showed them the scars, his hands and his side, didn't he? And yet he could appear in a locked room. And Jesus is saying that that power that is at work for him to suffer on the cross to rise again from the dead is also now at work in fulfilment of God's plan for the gospel to be reached, preached, for people to be reached in all nations. See, Jesus is alive, and because Jesus is alive, this work of reaching others with the gospel is his almighty powerful work. It's the work of God. It's been predicted in the Old Testament. And it's easy, I think, for us to sort of to feel weak and to feel this is beyond us uh, and this is just another thing to add in our long to-do lists and we feel so sinful and we feel but the people that God used back then are no different to us and God is still at work today his work of reaching people with the gospel he's planned since before the foundation of the world he's promised it's going to happen just like he promised Jesus would suffer that he would take the punishment for our sins, that he would rise again from the dead, and the gospel would be, reach people like you and me and other people through us. So thankfully, isn't it a relief? We can all take a sigh of relief. Thankfully, this work does not depend on us. It depends on the power of Almighty God through the living Lord Jesus. Um, I've got a vine in the, right at the back of the garden, and at the moment it looks completely completely dead because obviously it's winter and all the leaves have fallen off but there's a, but there's a life in it and and come the spring it will bud and the leaves will come out and and it will be seen to be alive but the i know this is not quite biologically accurate but it is scripturally accurate the life comes from the vine the sap the, the leaves come out the life comes from the vine and in the same way, Jesus uses that picture of the vine, doesn't he? That the life comes from him. The power comes from him. If we think we can do anything without him, no. Because Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. So we might feel weak. I certainly feel weak. There seems to be too much to do. Well, the power is going to come from Jesus. We need to trust in the living Lord Jesus, his resurrection strength. That's what will keep us going. I think we can all say, those of us who are involved in the church from the sort of day one, this has been the story of Cornerstone Church Colchester. 
And as soon as it's been a story for me, I was thinking when we started, I, I, I can't do this. I, I just do not have the strength to, to think about starting a new church. And I know, I think this is what the Lord wants us to do. But time and time again, the resurrection power of Jesus has kept us going. Isn't that true? Well, he's going to keep us going. I mean, and if God has said from before the foundation of the world, this is my plan for the whole universe. My son will die for people. He'll be raised to bring people into new creation. Is he just going to sort of, sort of stop halfway through? No. His resurrection power will keep us going. The source of power and the progress of the gospel is God's resurrection power at work through Jesus and in Jesus. So we're looking forward to what we're planning, but we just need to remember this. Let's trust in him, in our resurrected Lord Jesus, to be at work. Jesus is still at work because he's alive. And so we're going to be meeting next Monday. William Wade is coming. He's our speaker. We can talk more about this. We're going to be praying because this is where we want to start. We want to depend on the power of Jesus, on the resurrection power of Jesus. Not on our organisation, but on his power. So Jesus is still at work because he's alive. Secondly, Jesus is still at work by the Holy Spirit, so we need to depend on the Holy Spirit also. See, you might think, were the apostles not ready? Jesus had breathed on them, saying, receive my spirit in the upper room in John chapter 20. They had seen Jesus' <clears throat> miracles. They witnessed his death and resurrection. They'd heard all his teaching. They themselves had done miracles as he sent out the 72. But there is still not enough for them to do this job. So verse 4, Jesus says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Even the apostles, witnessing all they had done with the spiritual experience that they had, still did not have enough. <coughs> they needed more power. And so Jesus says, look, the Father is promised. See that verse 4, the promise of the Father. He, the Father has promised that the Holy Spirit will be poured out, will come. And he's taught them, Jesus has taught them in John chapter 14, that verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper or, uh, or counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So as Jesus has ascended to heaven, as he's been glorified, enthroned as the Christ, the King of the nations, the King of kings, Jesus says, wait, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not just that we're trusting in the life of Jesus, we're also trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is where it's helpful, very, very briefly, to remind ourselves of our relationship with each person of the Trinity. They are distinct. One God, three persons. But we have a relationship with each member of the Trinity. The Father made the sort of action plan of salvation. The Father sends the Son to be the Saviour of the world. He, he chose the Son before the foundation of the world to be the world's Redeemer. And then the Son comes into the world. He is incarnate. He becomes a human being. He dies on the cross. It's him we thank for his death on the cross. And then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the one who is here on earth, in us, among us, with us, connecting us to the life of God, Father and Son. And he applies salvation to individuals. But what does it mean for us to be baptised by the Holy Spirit? Well, it's a once-for-all event, as we'll see as we carry on in Acts. The Spirit had not yet been poured out because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So they were to wait. They were to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The whole church was to wait. The power of the Spirit is absolutely essential for this work of the gospel going to all nations. They knew Christ but they had not yet been baptised by the Holy Spirit. Now, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is a once-for-all event. If we're Christians, we have been baptised with the Holy Spirit. But we need to relate to the Holy Spirit. I mean, imagine what, uh, what somebody comes to me and, and says, uh, you, you must be so proud that you've given birth to your daughters. Now, that's wrong at so many levels. 
I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not the one who's given birth to my daughters. It's a different person. She's the one to be honoured for that. The Holy Spirit is the one, is the person of God who gives us birth, as, John, uh, as Jesus says in John 3. He's the one who brings us new birth from above. It's the Holy Spirit who applies what Jesus has done to the life of individuals. He's the one who empowers us. You see it all the way through the Acts of the Apostles. You could say that the Acts of the Apostles are the Acts of the Holy Spirit as he's poured out and then empowers the Apostles to go. We need to relate to each member of the Trinity rightly. The Father did not die for us. He sent Jesus to die for us. The Son is in glory. He has ascended. We approach the Father through him. He's our great high priest. And the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is the one we can thank for giving us birth into the family of God. It's the Holy Spirit who witnesses with our spirit that we are God's children. It's the Holy Spirit who gifts us to serve. We can thank the Holy Spirit for the gifting he's given us in order to serve one another. We know that, don't we, from 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 and 15. And it's the Holy Spirit, all the way through the Acts of the Apostles, who empowers the Apostles to preach, who empowers people to speak, who enables people to walk with the Spirit, to live lives <coughs> of godliness. So there we have it. As we, we think about passion for life, we're to trust in the, the living resurrection power of the Lord Jesus, but we're also to relate to the Spirit in such a way that we are depending on him, trusting in him, speaking to him, calling on him. But let's just, um, I, I just wanted to sort of finish here, because I think, oh, I don't know how, far, how long I've been going. <laughs> I don't know how much time I've got left, but I'll just finish here. I think it's very easy for us to, to read Acts, and, and we'll be spending time in Acts, and think, oh, that's back then, that, that's when things were different. Now it's just messy, and people are, well, they're just less open to spiritual things. But I think it, if we were to go through Acts, we would see that it's, it's a messy picture. Jesus is alive, and he's at work through his Spirit, poured out on the church, and it's the Holy Spirit who enables people. But it's messy. And I think sometimes we think if only life was neater, then we could get on with the work of spreading the gospel. But no persecution breaks out in, in chapter 8, and people have to flee Jerusalem, and they go speaking wherever they are, and Christians fall out, and Paul persecutes, but then he's converted. It's not neat, it's messy. And I think this is what it's always like. Because I don't think there was a sort of time of neatness in the church's life where there could be organisation of things and it all went sm smoothly and swimmingly well and thousands of people became Christians. Um, you know, I've just come back from Scotland and, and being up in Scotland reminded me of um, some of the history of how Christianity got to Scotland. It was through Patrick, St. Patrick first. He was a teenager, I don't know how old he was, 15 or 16. And he was kidnapped on the coast of the southwest. The Roman sort of culture had left Britain and Christianity and, and paganism had come sort of straight back in, but he, he had sort of Christian upbringing, but he was stolen by some slave traders and taken to Ireland as a teenager. And it seems that he came to faith in Ireland because he was kind of nominally a Christian. He wasn't really a Christian, uh, but through that, experience he started praying he was sent to work out on the, the mountains as a shepherd boy and that's where he started praying to God and and then God opened a way for him to come back he escaped from his captors but then that experience meant that he had a heart for the Irish who had never heard the gospel and so he then took a mission St Patrick that's why he's the patron saint of Ireland and then the gospels flourished because he was able to bring the gospel to Druids and then the next generation, Columba, sent a mission from Ireland to the Picts of the North and founded the Iona community, and the gospel came to Scotland. So can you see that that's very messy? Through somebody being stolen, uh, kidnapped as a slave. I, I, another, another example, I love the story of, of Spurgeon. Does everybody know the story of Spurgeon? 
No. So, um, a, a winter in, in some eight, 1800 and something or other, because <laughs> he was a Victorian preacher. Uh, Spurgeon was a teenager again, 16 year old, and uh, he was caught in a snowstorm and he stumbled into to, to Artillery Street Chapel, which is still there in the centre of Colchester. And because it was a snowstorm, the, the regular preacher didn't turn up. So somebody just sort of stood up and said a few words from the Bible in Artillery Street. And Spurgeon was converted at 16. And he went on to have a ministry which drew thousands and thousands of people to the Lord Jesus. But where did it start? This sort of messy situation, somebody doing their best in a situation that wasn't that promising in the middle of a snowstorm. In other words, God takes the messiness of life because he's promised to reach people through the power of Jesus' life in people like you and me, through the power of the Holy Spirit, in very weak, very unpromising situations to reach, reach the nations. So may God encourage our hearts uh, to be involved with passion for life. Amen.